All right, good evening. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education meeting here on Monday, January the 11th, 2021 at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. The meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchek. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by calling 630-743-4085 and recording their comment. Comments will be ex uh, accepted until we reach the public comment portion of the agenda. We will play all comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment. All right, we are gonna start off with our flag salute. So we are gonna welcome Indian Trail School. Good evening and happy new year to everyone. Thank you so much for having me here this evening and having the opportunity to showcase our amazing Indian Trail community. My name is Mariana Nicasio and I'm the proud new principal of an amazing community of stallions. To start us off, I would really like to talk about our students, our staff, and our community, and all the challenges that they have faced this year. However, that's exactly what I want to focus on. I want to focus on how do we turn these challenges into opportunities. To begin this evening, we have a flag salute performed by students both remotely as well as on site. Thank you. We will begin our presentation tonight with our Indian Trail PTA president, Mrs. Blair Covino, who is going to share all the amazing things that our PTA has done this year so far to support our community. Good evening. I'm Blair Covino, co-president of the Indian Trail PTA. Though this year has been quite different, our PTA has continued its work to support our staff, our students, and our families. This year, we were thrilled to welcome our new principal, Mariana Nicasio, to Indian Trail. She has done a fabulous job of building community and supporting the needs of all students, even though we cannot all be together. We are grateful for her partnership with our PTA, and we look forward to all the amazing work we can do together in the future. Though we started the year in remote learning and were unable to hold our annual back to school night, we still had a successful membership drive. This year we have 67 family memberships. In addition, our staff membership has increased greatly to 25 members. More parents and staff are attending our meetings because of the convenience of Zoom. At the beginning of the year, we sold Indian Trails yard signs. It's been wonderful to drive through our neighborhoods and see school spirit and pride. This is something we hope to continue to do in the future. Our families also participated in a Chalk the Walk campaign for the first few weeks of school. Students and parents left inspiring messages of gratitude and support for our staff. We have had dine and share events two times a month all year. Our families have enjoyed supporting local businesses, raising funds for our school, and having a great excuse to get takeout. Our fall fundraiser has traditionally been a pie sale, but this year we opted for the more COVID-friendly Charleston wrapping paper sale. Not only were we able to fundraise in a completely no-contact manner, but the sale was also very successful, raising over $3,800. A major goal of ours this year has been to provide extra support and encouragement for our staff. We were able to purchase parking lot signs for the school to help in the drop off and pick up process. And we provided an appreciation lunch for our staff on two different occasions. Our PTA normally provides class parties or celebrations for holidays during the year. Since we are unable to do that this year, we put together small gift bags for both the hybrid and remote students. Students received these gifts before winter break. 
Traditionally, our PTA gives each student a book on their birthday. This year, we gave every student a book as a part of their holiday gift. Our Indian Trail families also donated an incredible number of gifts for kids experiencing need during this time. In December, we partnered with Ms. Nicasio to host a story time with Santa on Zoom. This event was a huge hit with our students. Additionally, the first weekend of break, Santa drove through the Indian Trail boundaries in his red Corvette. His elf passed out candy canes and kids were able to get a socially distanced photo with Santa. In December, we had our book fair through Anderson's. It was great to support a local business and to be able to pick up books in a no contact manner. Parents were also able to purchase books teachers wanted for their classrooms. Though this year has been challenging, we have looked for creative ways to continue our work. Moving forward, we hope to find other ways to build community and support our staff. We are grateful for all the dedicated and generous students, parents, teachers, and staff at Indian Trail. Thank you. I'm extremely grateful to Mrs. Cavino and the PTA board for their partnership throughout this year. Like I said, it's been a challenging one, but it's been a really great one as well because we have partnered up to together to make sure that we continue to support and serve our community together. So I'm really grateful to them. I'd like to start off our journey of turning challenges into opportunities by first speaking about how we continue to connect with the community through cultivating, strengthening, and building these positive relationships during these challenging times. As a new principal to Downers Grove, communication, collaboration, and consistency were very important to me. I'm very grateful to our students, our staff, and our community for their warm welcome to me, as well as their patience during these difficult times. Our next video will showcase how do we connect with the community by building those positive relationships, finding a shared vision for our future, as well as keeping those lines of communication open. My goal from the start was to listen to my new school community and understand their dreams and wishes for the future of Indian Trail. From the very start, we have been building a culture filled with respect, positivity, and kindness. We rolled up our sleeves and began thinking about what we wanted this strange new school year to look like. Even before school started, our staff was eager to help me walk through current IT processes and we collaborated to ensure we created a safe environment that was filled with high expectations, kindness, and most of all, fun. Ready or not, we began the year with anticipation and excitement as we welcomed back to school our students and families. Our welcome back might have looked differently, but the same care and attention was there from the beginning. Together, our community eased into a new school year, with smiles and extreme joy to see each other. Purposeful opportunities were taken to ensure relationships were created with everyone. One question I asked everyone in our Indian Trail community was to describe the ideals and core values of Indian Trail. And together, we came up with a vision statement that encompassed the Indian Trail community and will help guide us in everything we do. Through it all, our Indian Trail community remains united, committed, and ready to face any challenge head on and turn them into opportunities. Transparency and parent involvement is key to the success of our community. And we look forward to sharing, involving, and celebrating all the great successes of our Indian Trail Stallions. As a proud principal of this community, it is no doubt that we have taken every opportunity to connect, cultivate, and build those relationships. Um, we make sure that we learn from each other and we take care of each other. And in fact, here are a few testimonials from some students and staff so that that way, if you don't believe me, here's what they say. <laughs> Hi, I am Beth Hatlin, the Reading Specialist at Indian Trail School. As we know, this year has been filled with so many challenges. Challenges for students and parents, challenges for teachers, 
challenges such as scheduling students, assessing students, students not having materials, students not participating, not being engaged. However, what I kept coming back to are the opportunities for teachers to dive deeper, to get to know students better, to build relationships with our students, to work on our relationships with parents, to see the opportunity and the great need that there still exists for collaboration and teamwork. Never has there ever been a time where collaboration and teamwork has been more valued. Landon, can you tell me, how did you turn a challenge into an opportunity? Well, one challenge I had was reading at home because it was hard to focus. But now I know that I need to continue to use my reading skills to continue learning. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing with me. Georgie, how did you turn a challenge into an opportunity? One challenge I, f I had was trying to find my math workplaces but I just had to keep practicing and now I, I know I'm good at finding things and now I can do homework faster. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing with me. I appreciate it. Hi, my name is Christy Hopkins and I'm a kindergarten teacher at Indian Trail. In kindergarten, we spend a lot of time learning social skills and how to be a friend. I knew this was going to be a challenge this year with the many restrictions that we would have in place, but it was something I was not willing to give up on. Learning how to talk, share ideas and thinking, use our imaginations, and having fun is just too important. I began brainstorming how and when I could still make these opportunities a reality for my kinders, while still following requirements to keep us safe, like keeping our six feet distance, using individual materials only, staying off the playground and staying in our own spaces. Individual mask break bags and individual center bins were my answer and gave my kinders the opportunity to learn to be social. While it did take some extra time and organizing on my part, it was truly worth it. With just a few items to use during outside time and only two center materials per week, they have wowed me with their imaginations and created games and objects I would have never thought of even as a kindergarten teacher. Each week, they continue to find new ways to use many of the same items outside and during their center time. And even better, they share their thinking with their peers near them through their voice, modeling, and playing while staying in their own space. It has been amazing to see how they have overcome what should be barriers and used it as an opportunity to still play, be social, and be a friend. So I have to either Zoom them, but uh, the good thing is that we're keeping everybody safe. Olivia, can you tell me how did you turn a challenge into an opportunity? Um, I have to wear masks a lot, so um, when I go outside, when it's winter, it feels really nice on your face because it keeps it warm. And I have to tell you, I have to agree 100% with Olivia, especially when I'm outside during arrival and dismissal, this face mask really keeps me warm, so I love that. Um, the next part I want to highlight is the amazing amount of heart that goes into our teaching and learning. That all begins with that social emotional learning through our second step lessons as well as our morning meetings. We continue to hit key target um, standards in English language arts through our benchmark program, and of course introducing our new math program bridges. Making sure that we are telling our story is very important and I have challenged our staff to take every opportunity to showcase the truly outstanding teaching and learning happening at Indian Trail. With the mental impact of the pandemic, we know that learning does not occur unless the social, emotional, and behavioral needs of our students are met. Now, more than ever, it is important to remain consistent and connected with our students. We use positive expectations and responsive classroom strategies such as morning meetings to continuously model expectations to our students and use positive teacher language to encourage success within our classrooms. With these mutual expectations, we built a family environment where all voices are respected, welcomed, and encouraged within the classroom. Second Step Social Emotional Lessons on a weekly basis help students identify their feelings, use positive self-talk, show compassion, and respond with respect to one another. 
We take great pride that the whole child is cared for, nurtured, and encouraged by inspiring them to be lifelong learners. In the fall, our second to sixth grade students took the NWEA MAP assessment in both reading and math, and in support of our district's strategic plan, our school has focused on creating opportunities for staff to meet on a weekly basis in professional learning communities to support the unpacking of the benchmark and big ideas units to target key standards and support the new learning of our new Bridges math curriculum. Through these conversations, we have been able to create differentiated opportunities, reteach, and extend learning for our students both on site and remotely. A big component has been structuring our MTSS process to ensure we are consistent in tracking and analyzing student data in order to implement appropriate interventions and enrichment groups based on student needs. Our teachers continue to target key grade level ELA standards in order to prepare students to be high functioning readers and writers. This year, using both our Bridges and Big Ideas math curriculum, our students experienced a new way of learning by using individual hands-on manipulatives to help them grasp concepts. Through problems and investigations, students are able to independently or through partner work collaborate, share, and compare strategies with each other. It's always amazing to hear students so eager to showcase how they help find a solution by saying, I have another idea. Through the engaging games of workplaces, students first practice them as a whole class to understand the concepts. In addition, teachers are using workplaces to work individually or with small groups of students to provide additional support or challenge learning. It's always great seeing the class compete against a teacher, which makes for a fun, competitive, and learning experience for everyone. Number Corner has provided a daily opportunity to promote both procedural fluency and conceptual understanding. Our classrooms are student-centered environments where learning is individualized for everyone by integrating iPads into our daily life. Our students are becoming critical thinkers, problem solvers, developing their creative mindset. It is without a doubt that in every corner of our school, whether it's hybrid or remote, there is an immense amount of teaching and learning happening by our amazing Indian Trail staff. As you know, Indian Trail is a preschool through sixth grade building that also encompasses the Grove Preschool Program as well as the RISE Program. And another night, the Grove Preschool Program will be highlighted, but tonight, with the help of our RISE Coordinator, I would like to highlight this program. RISE, turning challenges into opportunities. Indian Trail houses the district's RISE Program. RISE stands for Reaching Independence Through Structured Education. RISE is a specialized program designed to support students with autism spectrum disorder and related characteristics. As a population prioritized for in-person learning by the Illinois State Board of Education, students in the RISE program have participated in in-person learning in a hybrid model every day this school year. With the exception of the two fully remote days in November, when students and staff participated in remote learning routines and expectations from home, as well as the rest of the district. RISE also serves students whose families have chosen a fully remote model, as well as students who have had to participate in temporary remote learning for a variety of reasons. RISE students, families, and staff have truly been rising to the challenges of the current school year. RISE has been turning these challenges into opportunities with patience, grace, and flexibility in a number of ways. RISE has turned challenges into opportunities for connection despite distance, adhering to social distancing while on site, and having remote students sometimes zo zoom in to join their peers for activities like morning meeting, whole group lessons, and therapy groups. RISE has turned challenges into opportunities for creativity, using technology and hands-on materials to make crafts and create beautiful works of art. RISE has turned challenges into opportunities for honing skills and learning new skills, like writing, measuring, and even coding. RISE has turned ch challenges into opportunities for being silly for having fun, for celebrating holidays, and just being a kid during this time when it seems like so much is different in the world around us. 
Rise has turned challenges into opportunities to feel grateful for all that we have and all that we mean to each other. In Rise, we have been able to keep each other safe, even if it has meant staying apart or even staying home on some days. Through it all, we have kept learning and growing and rising to the challenges of the school year. It's been a great school year so far, and we look forward to what the rest of the year will bring. I'm very grateful to work with both Jacqueline and Maria. They're both great partners without a doubt, and I love working with them. No matter what this year has challenged us with, the Indian Trail community has worked tremendously hard to ensure that we continue to support, care, and love each other. Through the smiles, through the tears, through the laughter, our community remains strong in the face of adversity, continues to pay it forward, and remains committed to making a difference in this world through teaching, love, and inspiration. I am truly humbled to serve, to be there for my, my staff, to support them, to love them, to care for them, and I can't wait to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank much. you so much. Thank you. All right, our spotlight tonight is going to be a health and wellness update. So please uh, welcome up Todd Dreyfall. Hi, Todd. Good evening. Uh, last December, we uh, did a spotlight and brought uh, the board up to speed on uh, the health and wellness uh, and the processes and and everything that the Health and Wellness Committee has been working on uh, the last year and multiple years. Um, this year is a very a good year uh, from the standpoint of where the health and wellness is. Um, I'd like to say in part a lot because of the work that they've done, but um, some of that has been overshadowed by just the whole economy of things uh, and what people have done to adjust according to, uh, to COVID. Uh, nonetheless, that has helped uh, facilitate uh, a savings and a piece into the, into the program, into the plan. Uh, every month, the board receives uh, this into their year-to-date report that has uh, current and then the last three years of where uh, the health, the, the medical reserve fund uh, is comparative to previous years. This is on a cash basis. Uh, and the medical reserve fund is part of the uh, sub fund of the education fund. Uh, the district has four plans, and what three of those plans this last year, when uh, the health and wellness committee made the recommendation back in October to the board, uh, was for a zero increase um, for this next upcoming year. Uh, one plan, the new. Uh, HSA plan uh, that's been that the district has had now for two years uh, had a 5% decrease in its premium rates. We had open enrollment uh, in November and uh, that change takes effect January 1st. We actually had uh, I think a net one or, or zero change in HSA. We had some folks that, that switched out of the HSA uh, but then we also had some people that chose uh, the HSA. Obviously, with COVID this year, uh, the prior year, uh, we had a, a lot of support with the teachers' unions, with uh, an administrator and uh, someone from the committees going out and doing lunches uh, and being in buildings and talking to staff and explaining the new plan. Uh, that was extremely effective. Uh, this year, we did virtual meetings. We did them uh, in the morning, uh, afternoon, and then again, uh, we did a night, a night one. We had some people uh, with a fair um, participation in those, uh, but certainly not you know, the effect that we did when we were able to do those lunches in those schools. Uh, so we hope to get back to that uh, next year uh, and, and talk to staff. Uh, one of the things we did do in the in-service day was have one session uh, in the morning, um, and we, that was a pretty full session of people asking questions about health and, health and wellness benefits and we went through the, the health savings plan, but also all the overall benefits. And so 
Uh, we had some response asking for that to be in the future at the beginning of the year, so we're going to look for that. Uh, nonetheless, we are in a good position. Uh, you can see the, the green bar at, at, at uh, end of the month is certainly in a be much better position with cash on hand compared to previous years. I won't go over the chart. I'll go to the graphs instead. This, you see the green little bars there is the revenue per month coming in. And then you have the expenditures on the bar graph below that. Uh, this is the last, this is 2020. We will get December's numbers soon. We have a health and wellness committee, I think next week uh, coming up and, and we'll review those with them at that point when we have those. Uh, but. But this uh, shows that we have had many months where revenue exceeded expenditures, thus the reason for the premium freeze and decreases. This is the year before. And you can see the difference in, in the adjustments. Now, th there were adjustments to the plan. Um, we had made, we had switched to RX benefits for our pharmacy benefit manager. Uh, that allowed us to ha access the contracts to reduce our cost on on prescriptions and we've also uh, put in place um, structures to have evaluation of low what they call low value prescriptions to making sure that what is getting written is written for what is required and what the prescription is for and there's a review process that can happen with a handful of prescriptions that a doctor writes for and it, it happens with the provider and, and the ARX so we, uh, the, one of the things that with the new benefit committee in the last couple of years is, um, is changing and looking at wellness. And, you know, there are, there are a couple ways of keeping costs down in insurance. Is simply just don't use it. Um, there's one way and that is reducing benefit. Uh, the other way is helping incentive um, preventative care and finding things early and finding ways that you can uh, prevent usage of, of some things. And that's where wellness comes in. Uh, two, in, 20, in 2019, we had a $100 uh, wellness incentive for anyone who did the screening. Uh, the committee recommended we're working with our consultant CHC that um, that is as a, a very low number. We brought that up to 250. Uh, we rec recommended that to the board uh, with looking at what that would be over time and, and adjusting that. And so one of the things the committee will be doing in its next couple meetings is reviewing how that incentive, that incentive may change or adjust. Uh, this year we offered 250. We had a 60% increase in participation, which is rather impressive when you think about the environment they were in right now uh, with people being careful about um, going to, to doctors. I mean, we've seen the evidence of lack of use and utilization. Uh, certainly having that type of increase was impressive. Um, what was even more impressive is that the CHC found no significant increase in health risks with the increase in participation, which they said is abnormal. Normally when you have a significant increase in participation, you start to see an increase in um, issues and concerns and health risks. Uh, there were some, but not substantial. Uh, so that is also a good thing for us to see that we know that you know there is a, a use of, of preventative and people are, are, are paying attention to their health. Um, there is a survey as part of this wellness screening. Uh, what is notable is that the cancer screening, the preventative um, uh, programs that are available to people, uh, those who went through the screening, 70 to 80 percent were taking uh, use of those those programs and those those screenings for early cancer, which is also an, a wonderful, great um, mark that we have. We, uh, for men, uh, have some work to do. We trail the the, the ladies uh, as normal. Um, so we have some just kind of overall statistics and pieces as to you know, how much and where we're at with that. We don't want to, there's obviously the report is very lengthy and you know, overall not something to share as far as employee health piece, but 
overall, we're we're you know we're in, in pretty good shape. And this is some of that information about uh, utilization and, and wellness, and um, and we get into some of the savings pieces of what what good wellness prevention and incentives do, and help out and what we're looking for in benchmarks. Um, <coughs> this is where I get my cheat sheet. So some of the things that we are looking for down the road is ways that we can look at improving and reducing risks and programs that we can be offering. And that's the conversation that the committee will start to work into. And that is, do we shift some of that money in the screening? Uh, do we leave you know, a higher level in the screening knowing that that seems to have driven uh, participation and we still are looking for and seeing and wanting to make sure we're catching more people who may have been less willing to do that, but you know, have that incentive. Um, many of, uh, one of the things uh, CHC shares is that incentives are, are usually a little higher uh, in some places and see better results. Uh, so that's something the committee will be looking at and making recommendations for to the, to the board in the next few months. Uh, certainly there's an impact on, on screening and wellness and studies have shown that somewhere between five and 10 times of wellness money spent can go towards uh, reducing claims and, and has, a, has a return on investment uh, that's substantial. Um, our early numbers show that that level of participation and that increase in risk may not be necessarily the case, but then again, we don't, you know, not working to get a higher number and a higher response piece to look for those who are, are the least willing are usually the ones that we, we find they have the higher risk piece. <coughs> and this is some more just kind of the overall um, updates and, and participation pieces that we just kind of talked about in that summary slide. So next steps are working with the committee, as I said, uh, and coming back to the board and continuing to look at a two to three year plan uh, for wellness incentives that help uh, look at reducing risks and costs for the, for the plan overall. Now, the wellness incentive does come out of the medical reserve fund. So when we talk about those increases, that is coming from that fund uh, that is geared towards that. Um, and fortunately, we're in a position through other decisions that we've been making as well as you know, some of the COVID um, benefit piece of lower utilization that um, is helping uh, allow us to have some funds to do that type of thing. Uh, one of the things um, our uh, group alternatives, uh, Mike Baker has pointed out, uh, one of the large expenses is athletics and physical therapy. And that is a large area that we don't have expense in this last year because of the unfortunate ability of having a lot of athletic programs that, you know, so um, staff that have children who would participate normally who may get injured and a physical therapy is seven, eight, 10, 12, 15 visits. Um, and those have, you know, those have an impact. Um, not having that is, is also an expense piece. Um, but we've also seen a more increase in telemed and some of those other telehealth items that we've been driving and talking about earlier. And so hopefully when we come back out of all of this, some of those habits will develop and people will utilize those and will help control and contain some of those costs. And I think that is it. Questions? Anything? Thank you. Uh, I had a question about what we should be prepared for, what the, what the committee is prepared for. This is obviously a down year in medical expense and medical needs for uh, due to the pandemic. Hopefully, as we start to come out of the pandemic, I imagine that we will start to see an uptick in those. Should we for forecast, I guess, or foresee, uh, and our, as I guess, is our consultant expecting that uptick to happen, and are we prepared for it? Um, I think that, you know, I, 
I think everyone's expectation is that obviously that there will be, you know, when sports begins again, physical therapy will, you know, those, those items will, will come and probably even more so if, if, you know, student, if kids have not kept up with their training and conditioning. Uh, yeah, I don't think anyone would be surprised to see there's, there's going to be some increases. Uh, I, don't, I don't know it, what, I don't think anyone is, is sure about as to how and when and what that increase will look like as to what kind of a ramp that will be. Um, you know, we now are in January, you know, deductibles all start over again. Um, and, you know, so there's going to be some of that and, and that could lengthen and we're still into the, into a COVID uh, situation where, you know, we could have some delays for three to four to five months. Uh, I think we won't really see more impact, significant sharp increase or we'll be looking at until we're talking to you in October about the 2022 renewal and what the forecast is for that to see if there'll be some some more significant increases and hopefully by then um, like I said we'll, there'll be some you know, when you do something long enough you're using the telemed piece is a big piece or using uh, convenient uh, you know centers and so forth people have adjusted to doing some different things than they had done 18 months prior. Makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are five communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? Okay. And let's move on to the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. Thank you, Darren. Um, for the superintendent's report tonight for curriculum instruction, I just want to highlight on Monday, January 4th, District 58 conducted a very successful institute day. I was extremely proud of our staff for the amount of work that went into planning this day, the quality of the presentations and the professionalism of the participants. District 58 has many fine instructional leaders that consistently go above and beyond for our students, families, and staff, and that was really highlighted in the work for our institute day. Also want to remind everyone that today begins our winter benchmarking period during which all students in grades K through 8 will take the NWA math assessment in reading and math. Many of our students will also be assessed in reading and or math using Ames Web Plus data. That begins today and if you have any questions I would encourage all of our families to please reach out to your building principal or classroom teacher. In finance, uh, finally some potential good news to share. There is potential good news to share in terms of the district's overall budget for this school year. In the last stimulus bill that was passed by Congress, money was set aside for schools to help cover pandemic-related uh, costs and budget shortfalls. We are estimating that District 58 will receive approximately $800,000 spread over two fiscal years, uh, with the bulk of that coming in this fiscal year. While this will not cover the entire deficit, it is certainly welcome news. Now, the one thing I always want to highlight, and, and Todd is sitting here, so I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Please note we haven't received any of these funds yet. Um, however, if you look back to the CARES Act, we did receive those funds uh, timely, and we are expecting to receive those. However, I think we just need to be careful that we don't count those up before we actually get them. In terms of facilities, the work does go on uh, with modernization of our facilities. We're doing the best we can with a limited operating budget. Uh, tonight I want to share with you some work that we're proposing takes place at Fairmount Elementary School. As we work through the pierced outer roof and mechanical equipment upgrades, we are also working to cover other problematic areas. One of those areas of focus has been the Fairmount mechanical equipment. Several items at the building are operating on borrowed time, having well surpassed their anticipated useful life. Uh, really one of the things that we're targeting is the rooftop unit for the air conditioning uh, a section of the building does have air conditioning uh, it is recommended that they get replaced every 15 years to show you how uh, well our maintenance team does in district 58 the last time it was replaced was 1988 and so we are well on borrowed time for that piece of equipment in terms of personnel i've talked many times about substitutes in district 58 just a reminder but uh, we do have substitute positions available for those who are interested in the community if you contact our personnel office, we can uh, assist you with that application process. Uh, but the unfilled positions have really been handled very well since around Thanksgiving, and we are not seeing significant shortages at this particular point with the changes that we've put in place. So I just wanted to share that again with the Board of Education. 
In terms of technology, one of the things that we always like to remind our Board of Education, our community, is that the district takes advantage of every opportunity we can to save money. One of those programs is called E-Rate. The FCC's E-Rate program makes telecommunications and information services more affordable for schools and libraries. With funding from the Universal Services Fund, E-Rate provides discounts for telecommunication, internet access, and internal connections to eligible schools and libraries. Dr. Eichmiller and his team continue to utilize E-Rate services to save the district money as permitted uh, on things like internet access and other switches. Uh, we will continue to take advantage of this program as the money is made available to the school district. Student services, it's hard to believe, but we're already starting to plan for school year 21-22. And one of the first steps in that planning process is our preschool program. Our gold-rated preschool, Downers Grove, or excuse me, Grove Children's Preschool program invites prospective preschool families to attend a virtual open house on Wednesday, January 25th, and on Thursday, January 26th, from 6 to 7 p.m. Please check our website for more information or contact Henry Puffer or Indian Trail School. I want to take some time to update the board on uh, new guidance we've received from the State Board of Education and IDPH regarding uh, quarantine and, and uh, other school exclusionary requirements. Once again, the guidance has been updated and the, our new FAQ documents are posted to help schools with the school exclusion decision tree providing additional guidance related to everything from travel restrictions to quarantine periods and instrument covers. Per CDC guidelines, the IDPH has outlined a process that would allow students and staff in quarantine to return after 10 days if they meet additional testing requirements. District 58 will permit students and staff to return after 10 days if they are close contact so long as they meet these requirements. Really the biggest change here is instead of a 14 day quarantine period, which is still recommended, you can shorten that quarantine period if you receive a negative test with no symptoms after the sixth day. And so that is permissible by the CDC and the health department has endorsed that. What the health department has not endorsed is allowing adults to come back after seven days. So we are sticking with the health department's recommendation and only permitting that in 10 days and only if uh, uh, someone that has not shown any symptoms and they have a negative test. Links to these new updated documents will be included in the board summary that is sent out to parents and also posted on our COVID-19 uh, page on the website. In terms of public relations, I want to take this time to thank two groups that have consistently uh, provided grants for our teachers. That is the Education Foundation of District 58 they recently awarded 11 grants, totaling more than $5,500 to District 58 teachers and staff. In addition, last week, the Downers Grove Junior Women's Club awarded nine grants, totaling more than $2,700. We are very grateful for these two groups for their continued support of our teachers, staff, students, and greater community. I also would like to update some exciting news we found out about the Education Foundation. Education Foundation board members Brian Kajewski and Caroline Kellum advocated on behalf of the foundation to secure an additional $7,500 in CARES Act funding for the foundation's COVID-19 Family Support Fund. The COVID-19 Family Support Fund provides grocery gift cards to District 58 families struggling financially due to the pandemic. That's really exciting news and we're very grateful for our foundation for getting more and more money into that. Again, I want to highlight to anyone out there in the community who needs assistance or if you know of anybody who needs assistance, please contact our business office and we're Happy to help you in a confidential manner. I want to start, or, um, conclude my remarks tonight by talking about vaccinations. The DuPage County Health Department has provided frequent updates to school districts regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. The DuPage County Health Department anticipates that Group 1A will be done in the next couple of weeks. That's certainly exciting news. Group 1B, which includes educators, will start immediately after Group 1A. This group will take much longer to vaccinate, however, because Governor Pritzker recently expanded it beyond essential workers and it now includes those over 65. That's an additional 100,000 people in DuPage County. According to the Health Department, approximately 180,000 individuals are now in Group 1B. The DuPage County Health Department receives about 10,000 doses per week. They're hoping that can go up to 18,000 doses per week. So if this does not increase, it will take some time to get everyone through Group 1B. Um, we were informed by the Health Department earlier today that they recommend that we work with our high school districts 
and secure private partnerships to help us give the vaccines once the um, health department is able to distribute those to the local school districts. So that is exactly what we are doing. The District 99 Consortium is working together to partner with those groups and we have experience and partner, we partner with those groups a lot. Uh, for instance, I just talked about CHC and the well-being shots that we give. So we're looking to that format and the health department has encouraged us to continue to do that along with the regional office of education. Uh, so all of the superintendents in the 99 consortium begin that work tomorrow and we will be working with them. But I do wanna let um, all of our staff know that it may take longer than anticipated uh, because 1B is such a larger group than it was originally planned for. Uh, in terms of vaccines for students, obviously the FDA has not uh, permitted use for uh, students yet in the elementary setting, uh, but we will of course let our families know as soon as we find out more on that. Uh, these vaccines certainly offer a light at the end of the tunnel and we eagerly await their arrival. And so that is where we're at. And of course, I'll continue to let the board know as information becomes available. That concludes my report. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions or comments? No. Kevin, a question about um, the partnership with the vaccine distribution. Mm -hmm. What's the potential like end state there? Does that mean that we would we would staff and distribute the vaccine to our staff? We would distribute it to our staff on our premises or in partnership with local health organizations? Or how, what would that actually mean? Yeah, so um, it means that the vaccines, rather than have our staff go to the health department or go to their alternate site in Villa Park, we would actually do that at the local high schools. Why the high schools? They tend to have much bigger um, areas that we could do that at. So I would anticipate all the 99 group being vaccinated at either Downs Grove North High School or down at South High School. In terms of who actually gives the shot, that would be that private partner or a, a public entity or a nonprofit entity like Good Sam. Um, and again, we haven't secured a partnership with Good Sam, that's just an example. They would actually be the ones who have to give the shot. The reason they have to give the shot is because of insurance liability and those who have already been trained on how to store and utilize the vaccine. So our staff is not able, our nursing staff, to actually give the shot, but what we would be asking our staff to do, and Jessica continues to work with them, is to help with the administrative piece of all of that, making sure that people get to where they uh, need to be. And so I think what we can anticipate over the next several weeks is really um, all of our school districts giving the county our final numbers, surveying our staff to figure out who exactly is willing to go get vaccinated, what that will look like, and then developing a schedule with that private party. Is, is there an anticipated cost with a private partnership like that that we should Yeah, have? so one of the, we, we asked that question today, and again, these are rough estimates, but what the health department is telling us is it's around that 30 to $40 mark. They're seeing about $36. Uh, and because this is uh, viewed as wellness, that is something that the insurance um, typically takes care of. And so obviously we are, we're gonna be working with Todd and Mike Baker, uh, but around $36 is the number. Of course, that could go up or down, but that's what we're looking at per uh, vaccine. It takes anywhere from five to seven minutes for each individual to go through the vaccination process. Sounds good, thank you. That's per shot or per, per person? It's per shot. Um, now, keep in mind that once you get vaccinated, then you have to wait around for a while just so they make sure, and I'm, I'm getting way out of my league here on some of those <laughs> logistics, but um, the, the, the shot process is about five to seven minutes, and then you have to sit and, and wait for a little bit. And it can be everything from uh, gymnasium setup or even a drive-through setup where people pull in through tents like you do uh, for the testing. But I guess to Darren's question, I don't know if, he's, if he and I are thinking yeah. the same thing. You say per shot, you're going to need to get two shots. So yeah. it's $36 per person times two, is that correct? Correct. And so that's something that we'll be working with the health department on. Again, that could change. So as we get more information on that, we'll let you know. And we would be coordinating their second shot as well, right? Yes, and so, um, and that's where there is some debate right now in, in differences between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. Currently right now in Operation Warp Speed, they are holding back second doses. And there's some debate right now that the Biden administration may just put them all out in the anticipation that there won't be any supply chain disruptions or manufacturing disruptions. And so that's what we're waiting to see. That's why in my superintendent's report, I was very careful to say, at the current rate, but it could increase. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you. Wow.
back. You're ready, huh? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, uh, Mr. Drayfall, with our <laughs> with our monthly business report. You uh, you have uh, your year-to-date report, um, and if you look at it, you might note that the salaries are a little bit higher than the prior month, and that's because um, January 1st was a payday, which meant that we paid before that. So we had one extra pay in December um, of, of 2020, and um, as because 2020 would be an anomaly in so many ways, uh, we had actually one, there were 27 pays, that, and therefore all of the benefits were paid out, so the benefits weren't charged. I mean, it all works out. Obviously, payroll's adjusted all of this. Everyone, you know, all the benefits are taken appropriately and so forth, but um, it, it, it just has an anomaly piece because of that January 1st. So uh, overall, though, we are in um, trending uh, right along with uh, other years on most expenses, with the exception of transportation. Transportation is considerably lower. Um, we are one of, we have, and, and understand we have four vendors. We are main vendor, obviously, is for student. Um, we have another that does special ed. We have other vendors that do uh, home to school for homeless and other one-off um, requirement areas and so forth that we need to cover. Some of those areas are where we're finding uh, even more significant savings uh, than our larger uh, larger firms. Now, special ed is still running, you know, their programs and so forth as much as or more than some of the others. Um, so, you know, we have that piece, and right now. We are seven, eight hundred thousand uh, dollars below expenditures at last, than, you know, at last year at this time. Uh, we don't see that that. I mean, I don't. I'm not predicting today because we're at fifty percent that it's going to be one point six million dollars reduction. Um, that that'll double, but it will be a considerable uh, lower expenditure for year end in the transportation fund than we initially budgeted for, so there's gonna be some savings there. Um, that's a double-edged sword because there is a reimbursement piece uh, in that, and that will have an impact. We are working through the projection on the financial plan, uh, so we update all of that um, and take that into effect for fund balance year end, as well as what revenue will be for next year. Uh, but it's always good when you don't, I mean, when there's a less expenditure uh, in an area. So. Overall, you know, year to date, we're we're in we're in good position, uh, comparative to other years. Um, we also have on the agenda a, a variety of items. We have, uh, as the board may remember, last month a uh, electrical rate uh, discussion piece, and that res that uh, action item is on there uh, this month, so that we can go forth and work with our vendor to lock in uh, future electrical rates at. at what seems to be continual low costs in, in, the, in the marketplace. You have uh, two bond resolutions on the agenda. That sets into motion a structure and a time frame uh, that does not, you're not borrowing money today or issuing bonds today. You are simply establishing a, me a meeting date uh, in the future and establishing a 30-day a window uh, for petitions um, for those if someone so so calls to, to ask for those to come in. Uh, these bonds are $3.3 million of new money. $3 million is capital. Obviously the large portion of that is the Pierce Downer Roof. See, so I got that right this time. <laughs> uh, um, I was re-roofing the wrong, wrong school on Friday morning. Um, <laughs> as well as other asphalt, uh, mechanical, and, and other areas. Uh, in the district that we've uh, determined to be priority capital items for this next summer. Um, those pieces, and you're going to have some uh, items on there to approve, uh, start contract with work with White to start that contracting and putting all of those together to get out the bid. Other things are going to be going, the roofing will be going out the bid uh, very shortly, like tomorrow or this week, um, you know, and, and, and that'll be coming due. We certainly will not bring the final approvals for those bids to you until we have you know, closed on the bonds because we can't approve a bid before we have money to pay for it. Uh, but that sets that whole process in motion. Uh, the second bond issuance that will be with this 
is a restructuring of the current debt. Um, we have our debt that is under, uh, we call it a DESA, a debt service extension base that limits the amount uh, that the district can borrow on an annual basis. This is, um, and, and right now is a very good time to restructure and refinance, and there's some savings uh, in there that allows us to do that. All of that put together with this, uh, with this new bond money you know, puts a structure in place so that um, we can get some capital work done uh, the summer without it impacting operational expenses, uh, which was our initial conversation back in November and early December as to as we were looking at this, but we've worked through. The markets are in a good position for us for this year uh, and believe that we have an opportunity to take advantage of that and get some work done. Uh, and then you have an abatement, uh, but asbestos abatement floor replacement. Part of that funding comes from the school maintenance grant uh, that the district had received some time ago. These were, uh, you believe it or not, we started with looking at items that would not be impacted by the master's facility plan in any level that we needed to do that were not that were impactful, had health life safety issues, there's carpet problems and it's decaying, there is asbestos tile under that carpet, so obviously there's an abatement, and looking at something that didn't have an extensive cost to our operations but allowed us to use that maintenance grant uh, under the rules and regs that the state allowed back in 2019 when it first started. Uh, so that's coming to fruition and that will be done as well. So I think I have most of the things we've done. Are there any questions? Anything? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right, uh, the policy committee, I don't believe met, but we still have a recommendation for a revision of policy 7190 on student behavior. So Dr. Russell. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on behalf of uh, Tracy and Jill. What this is is actually um, a result of our compliance visit. Every five years, the regional office of education comes in and they review everything. And while we do have the most updated press manual, the ROE is recommending that in policy 7190, in order for all of its districts to come into compliance, they add a little bit more to the isolated timeout, timeout and physical restraint uh, paragraph under this policy. So the suggested language that they would like added, which we agree with, uh, will read the following. The district does not allow the use of isolated timeout. Physical restraint is used as a last resort when a student presents an imminent threat to themselves or others. Restraint is provided commensurate with ISBE guidelines and only by staff members certified to do so. The reason this is coming up this school year, if you remember last year, there was a ProPublica article in the Tribune that really raised the issue of how some districts throughout Illinois were using this. We were not one of them. Uh, but nevertheless, in order to be in compliance with the regional office, my recommendation is that you take uh, 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 an unusual step because we typically don't um, you know, adopt a policy in the same night that we're um, suggesting language. However, because this is in compliance, you are permitted to do so under uh, Section 2 of our board policy manual. And so I would recommend that the board later on in the agenda at this action item go ahead and approve this uh, just so we can be in, in full compliance with the regional office. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, the legislative committee did not meet in December. Uh, the financial advisory committee did. We met uh, last Friday. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because uh, what we primarily focused on, we did a quick look at, at the year-to-date report, as we always do, but the, the majority of the time we spent uh, reviewing some of the options in the process that they went through for deciding um, how to bring our bonds to market. So we had a PMA who um, will bring our bonds to the market, and we had our underwriter. Who's our underwriter? What's uh, uh, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was there as well. And... Uh, they talked to us about a couple of things. One of the things that they mentioned that hasn't been yet mentioned yet in this meeting is we currently have a, a, an AA1 rating with Moody's. They did recommend, there was a recommendation that we go out and get a second um, rating as well with S&P. So um, if, if Todd's not in here, right? But our plan is to move forward with getting that second rating. Is that correct? Yes, our plan is to move forward with the, with the second rating. So we're going to do that. Um, while it may not play a big uh, part in, in helping our rate this time around, 
we are now establishing a relationship with uh, a second rating agency in case we need to go out for larger bonds uh, in the future. But uh, primarily we talked about the structure of which was laid out in the MU that everybody received uh, and what these, uh, the two action items that we have uh, coming up later today. We also did take a little bit of time to discuss um, Longfellow is a, is a property and what steps we may want to take moving forward um, with that property um, kind of is part of our uh, master facility plan. So uh, we, we just had a brief conversation on that, but that's something that we teed up kind of for a conversation to have uh, in our next FAC meeting, and which would probably lead to a, a discussion um, in our next board meeting. But other than that, uh, that, was, that was about it. Uh, unless Steve has anything you would like to add. Great summary. Great. Any questions on that or on the uh, agenda items that we have later on regarding the, the bonds? Perfect. The district leadership team did not meet in December um, and neither has the health and wellness uh, committee. So that brings us to the discussion portion of the meeting and we're going to do, this is a great opportunity for us to do the return to learn updates. So uh, Mr. Sissel, I know is here and I, I know Dr. Russell has some comments as well? Yeah, because of COVID, typically we would both give it down there, but I think I'll give my, I have a smaller portion, I'll give it here and then uh, Justin can be down there and then of course we'll both uh, answer questions. So as promised, we, we had thrown out this date January 11th, we'd come back to the board and review how things went uh, during the first half of the year and uh, here we are, believe it or not. And so uh, we welcome the opportunity to talk to the board about uh, things that we're seeing and, and uh, what we'd like to recommend moving forward. So tonight's object or objectives, excuse me, really after taking a look and analyzing all the feedback um, from staff, uh, from our families, administrative discussions, our goal tonight is to provide the board with the following. We want to update uh, the community on the instructional model for trimester two. We want to provide an outline of potential growth areas for our instructional model at all grade levels and a timeline and process for addressing those identified growth areas. As we went about this work, the guiding principles that are really driving this work, first and foremost, the health and safety of students and staff has remained our number one priority and will always be our number one priority. We also want a continued prioritization of in-person and live synchronous instruction. So not just for the kids that are on site, we want to continue to prioritize that, but also for our remote only students, making sure that they have that live uh, synchronous instruction. There's a big desire for consistency and a recognition of the impact of significant change on our system. One of the things that we heard over and over again uh, in the feedback from both staff and families is how much change really impacts people. Uh, and, and that was a significant thing uh, that we really wanted to take into consideration. Uh, we also want to minimize or eliminate completely teacher changes for students. Also, uh, one of the principles was a desire for a plan that looks as far forward as possible. Even though we might not get there today, what is the plan for a month from now and then two months from now until the end of the school year? Providing rigorous instructional opportunities by tending to the social emotional needs of our students and staff is also very important. And then the ultimate goal of five day a week in person instruction for all students when it's safe and feasible to do so. So those are the principles as we went about this work. And I, before I turn it over to Justin, I want to commend uh, Mr. Sissel and, and the entire team, but Mr. Sissel in particular for his hard work in this area. On the next slide or the slide you see here, uh, the amount of meetings and discussions that Mr. Sissel has had, uh, we really appreciate all that work and it really does help fine tune our plan into something that we can continue to be proud of. So with that, Justin, take it away. Thank you, and, and I appreciate that. And I think this list of, without highlighting each and every meeting that's happened, what's captured here is, is not only administrative conversations, which certainly are always a part of, of decision making, but the conversations with the, the broader administrative team and then with working groups of staff and then with the entire staff. You'll remember on December 11th, we took some deliberate time to ensure that all staff voices could have 
a part of this conversation. And I'll, ha I'll try to remember to highlight a couple of them as we go through, but many of the ideas that you're going to see posited tonight are not the result of any one of these meetings, but they truly are the synthesis of a lot of dialogue and a lot of discussion, and that's what's really exciting. So while, while I appreciate Dr. Russell's recognition, I, I will immediately turn it back to this is really the synthesis of a lot of people willing to have candid, thorough, thoughtful conversations and in, in reviewing all of the feedback on our own experiences to, to get to what we believe is the best we can do for all of our students and all of our staff within this pandemic year of instruction. So when we talk about the model for the remainder of trimester two, we want to just open and clearly state we are not recommending any schedule changes, any structural changes to the learning model we have for the duration of the second trimester. We had kind of, as Kevin mentioned, we had kind of set up this January 11th date as some sort of a, 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 a could be a major turning point. And, and what we're going to say tonight is that it's not going to be a recommendation to make a significant adjustment at this time. Um, that means we'll continue with the hybrid model with that fully remote option as we have. We do need to continue to be prepared. If, if we've learned one thing, it's that you can't predict three, four weeks or a month down the road. And so we know that we have a structure that allows for a short-term adaptive pause without any major schedule shifting or changing. We experienced that in November. We also, you know, we had received a lot of feedback that if we were going to be into a longer term, fully remote scenario for, for most students or for almost all students, there, there initially was some preference around, well then would we look at shifting the model and what would it look like and would we resume something a little similar to the way we opened the year in September. The truth is that as we really reviewed all of the feedback and continued with conversations, even some of the, the most staunch advocates of that model acknowledge that if it's only for a week or two, the impact of that transition wouldn't necessarily be worth it. We wouldn't, the gains we might realize instructionally wouldn't be worth the disruption. When we, you know, even when we took the adaptive pause, we shifted the PM schedule for grades one through six by 10 minutes. We received feedback that that had a, a stronger impact on families and schedules and, and teachers than, than we anticipated at that time. And so we do want to continue to do some work in the background so that in the unlikely event, and we do truly believe it's unlikely, in the unlikely event that we found ourselves in a mandated into a fully remote period for longer than a couple of weeks, we'd have the opportunity to consider making that shift at that time. We'll be prepared to talk about it. We'll be prepared to, to look at what implementation would be. But generally speaking, the feedback we've received was, if it's only a week or two, let's keep these things as consistent as they possibly can be. And some of the reason that we're maintaining this model are the fact that there were a lot of positive components in survey feedback and conversations around what we are currently doing. I know these quotes will be a little difficult to read on the screen and probably at home as well, but without reading through all of them, these are direct quotes from the survey feedback. And to be fair, it's where we asked for some positives. We asked what was going well. But these are some of the things that have been borne out through not only survey feedback, but through conversations subsequent to that. The daily contact with students, the daily synchronous contact was an incredibly important point when we elected this model, particularly in our elementary buildings. The flexibility, the consistency, all of those pieces are borne out in those quotes. And, and again, these are six or seven examples of thousands and thousands of open-ended feedback pieces. So we want to acknowledge that synchronous time, the synchronous specials. There were a lot of things to celebrate within this instructional model. And that's a big part of why we are confident in continuing with the structure we currently have in place. With that said, there's also certainly a lot of feedback that points us toward areas that we can improve, and, and that's what we wanted. We want to be involved in that continuous improvement process. We also, as Kevin mentioned earlier, want to recognize the impact of any changes that we might make. And so as we think about potential change that could be happening short-term and long-term, we want to make sure we have opportunities for discussion and clear communication, and also keeping in mind manageable timelines and implementation structures and strategies Earlier this year, we, we took advantage of the planning days that were allotted by the state based on the, the conditions of instruction this year. We do not have any more of those days readily available. So if we think about longer term significant changes, all of that has to be part of our thought process going forward. The next portion of the presentation is gonna be organized around some of these goal areas or growth areas that have been identified, both through survey feedback and multiple staff conversations. You're gonna see some, some higher level goals and then some more specific strategies and steps to try to achieve those goals, as well as whether this is a shorter term or a longer term conversation. So the first 
converse, the first topic that came up across so many conversations is that desire to continue to ensure that our students are engaged in learning. And that's not to say that they aren't at this time. The reality is that despite the very best efforts of our teachers and our students and our families, there are constraints around instruction right now that don't leave us with some of the same engagement strategies and tools and, and tricks that would be as readily available to us as they are in a typical year of instruction. There's also a component of engagement that has to do with the, the sequence and the consistency. The, you know, there, there's a part of consistency that kids thrive on, but when things start to become or feel formulaic, that can also see a decrease in engagement as well. And so you'll see some overlap in some of these growth areas as we go through the presentation. We've already begun our institute day that Kevin mentioned earlier. There were, there were dozens of sessions around student engagement and conversations about that. We're working at the building level. We're working through a, a number, like I said, of different strategies. And I think some of the structural pieces we'll talk about in a couple of minutes in the presentation also will support this. There's also an acknowledgement that there are a handful of families throughout the district who are struggling to engage remotely, who have elected fully remote. And, and we want to continue our outreach plans with those families and continue to strengthen that. You know, obviously our goal is to remain connected and engaged with every single student in the district, and we want to make sure that we are continuing to be aware of circumstances, certainly flexible, but also working to engage with all students and all families. So this is one of those goals that is immediate, is work is already happening, and it will be ongoing throughout the, you know, the course of the rest of the school year. And truly, some of the structures and strategies we may engage to promote this growth area will be things that will continue beyond this year. And that's another one of the things we, as, as we continue to learn different approaches, some of them may continue to be embedded in, this, in instruction going forward. The second major area we want to look at centers around the temporary remote scenarios. So this slide focuses on K-6. And really, this is the situation where a student finds themselves quarantining for a, uh, uh, in a mandatory situation for a COVID-related reason. We've made a commitment to do our level best to keep those students connected to their learning while they are quarantined. And, and I will tell you that's a commitment that I am proud of as District 58. It is not a common thread across the county. It is not a common experience for every student in every school district. This is something that we have really made uh, a, a priority for our students so that if they do find themselves in a mandatory multiple day quarantine, they are not simply catching up on distance home. We are trying to keep them as engaged and connected as possible. Our goal has never been to replicate the learning experience because there are some shifts that have to happen, right? In some cases, based on what a school configuration may look like, there may be that same teacher has a remote section in, in, in the opposite, you know, of the morning or the afternoon. That's an example where things can happen really consistently and cleanly for students. But there are many other scenarios across the district that are not as consistent and, and sometimes not as efficient or effective for students, again, despite everyone's really strong best efforts here. And so this is an area we want to look at, both so that we can make sure we have consistent options for students who will find themselves quarantining, and to help to maintain the classroom communities of those remote sections. There are a number of remote sections across the district where we'll have a number of students who are fully remote and will be in those sections for the duration of the trimester, and then they may find themselves with a number of students in any given day who are in that temporary remote situation. So this is one of those solutions that will not be a district-wide consistent approach. This is going to be a number of possibilities based upon the configuration of each of our individual buildings. We have some schools that have a remote section at almost every grade level or every grade level. We have other schools that have one or two remote sections in the way that works. We have some schools that have, as you know, one teacher at a grade level, some that have three and four. And so because of the neighborhood school concept and because of the difference in families at any given building and, at, and actually any given grade level that chose to be fully remote, these solutions will vary by building and potentially by grade level within the building. Some of the things we're looking at, we are looking at partnering some schools up. We're looking at how those grade level team configurations can work within a school to, to maintain students in remote sections across a grade level team. We're also exploring what we're, what's called concurrent teaching, which is the idea that a student might zoom into a classroom from home while that classroom was being taught um, in person on site in, in the hybrid model. We want to be careful as we talk about concurrent teaching to, in this scenario that what we're looking for, again, is that solution that is a way to keep students connected. It may not get to the level of engagement that a remote section would be. As we talk through the, the possible solutions here, we're, you know, we're looking at something that is keeping the child connected 
and you know, to do concurrent teaching at the level of every other instructional strategy that we employ in District 58 can, can be done very well, but it takes a significant amount of training and, and time to develop that. And so this would be a form of concurrent teaching that would be designed, again, in this model for connection, not necessarily as the most robust scenario that we could offer across typical instruction. This is another thing we expect to be working on this month, and hopefully by the end of the month we'll be able to implement a number of these solutions at each building. The third growth area is the same concept, but for middle school. And the reason it needs to be looked at differently in middle school is because if you think about the middle school schedule and structure the way we have this, there are right now some cases where a, a teacher who has a student on site may also have a remote section, and so there, there are some possibilities where that may exist. But we really don't have the number of remote sections available across the middle school uh, staff to accommodate everyone who is in temporary remote without major schedule shifts. You know, it's one thing for an elementary student to join a different third grade teacher's class for a period of a few days and to, re and to create that schedule. That alone has logistical hurdles. To have a middle school student find eight new sections that are all fully remote for a period of seven or eight days or 10 days it is logistically significant. And so what we've done up till now in most cases, because the, if you, the middle school structure has one day on-site, one day off-site, we've, in temporary quarantine situations, we have had the students attend remotely on the days that they already would have attended remotely, and then connect via Google Classroom and, and keeping up on their assignments on the days that they are not connected. We would like to explore, is there a way to do a little more for those students? Is there a way to keep them a little more synchronously connected with on those days that they are not currently in the quarantine situation? Doing that quickly scales at the middle school, because if you think about even three or four students across a couple of cohorts times eight teachers, within a couple of students, you're at virtually every teacher would have to engage in whatever solution. And so as we've talked about concurrent teaching in the way I just described it as a possibility at the middle school, there's a number of, uh, the feedback runs the gamut from apprehensive to eager to learn more to excited to try it. But again, because this wouldn't be able to be a small scale solution, we wanna make sure that we give time to explore all of the feedback and questions and possible solutions that did come out of those conversations in, in late December. And so this is one of the first goals that we're going to talk about convening a, a committee that would do the work to explore all of the, the components around achieving this goal and then report back to us in a few weeks. And so I'll hold on talking about the committee structure for just a little bit, but the idea is this is something that to begin the work, we would need to convene a committee and have a number of subsequent conversations. The fourth area goes back to grades one through six. And this really talks about that synchronous versus asynchronous instruction and the pacing and structure of how all of that works together. In our current model, we've really focused on consistent pacing because so many of those shifts for students in temporary remote situations or with potential model shifts could happen at virtually any time. We also know that there has been, there's a, num a large amount, excuse me, of asynchronous work that is required as part of this instructional model. Much of that has been developed at the district level and has been set to align with, again, some very specific pacing for classrooms. And so there is good to that consistency of pacing because it keeps us aligned as a district to be sure, but there also is a growing sense after a period of time of that formulaic structure where teachers have reached out and given us some feedback and said, you know, there are things that I like to sort of drop in, the, the reader's theater experiences, the, the things that, that connect kids to learning in different ways and make it even more engaging for them. And some of this pacing and some of this adherence to some of the asynchronous material that's been provided has stifled that a little bit. Uh, you know, not to say that those experiences don't exist. I think you could walk into most classrooms and find those fun activities and certainly the, the engagement and connection with teachers. But the reality is that the pacing does impose some restriction on that as well. And so when we go back to how are we gonna keep kids engaged? How are we going to, to think through all of these? And, and how does that temporary remote situation play in? If we can alleviate some of that frequent switching of classes for kids who are temporarily remote, if we think about engagement and, and, and go at things in a little bit of a different way and give teachers a little more grade level, building level autonomy in some of that decision making, while maintaining consistency, obviously the same standards, the same content as we always do, we think that this really will be a way that might, in some ways, actually require a little bit of, of different work for teachers, but will also 
access some of that autonomy, some of that accessibility of, of relaxing the pacing just enough to solve some of that feedback that we got that really does start to say, again, some of the, the student engagement pieces we're hearing is, I come to school every day, I do reading, I do math, I have a little something else, and, and, and I go home. And yes, reading and math will always be points of emphasis when we're talking about prioritizing instruction, but really getting into some conversations with our grade level teams about how can we make sure that we don't become so structured and so scripted through the end of this year that we lose some of that spark. The fifth area is an overall goal of increasing synchronous instructional time. And again, at grades one through six, we, we talked about this months ago when we first talked about the instructional model and the plan that we were presenting. The desire to increase instructional time, synchronous time, whether that's on-site or a combination of on-site and synchronous remote time, is certainly, I think, a desire of, of virtually everyone because we, we all would like to make sure that we are seeing our kids for more than just that, that two and a half hours per day right now for that individual classroom teacher. The challenge here is that there isn't a, a quick or simple way to flip that switch that won't have some impact on the overall schedule and structure. And so from a grades one through six perspective, this is a goal that we also will look to a planning committee to explore the feasibility of some possible solutions for this goal. Going back to middle school, another piece of feedback that we've heard from families and staff alike is that the day is, is pretty long. You know, in a typical, a typical middle school day, in a typical year is longer, but there are natural breaks built in with a lunch and home base period during the school day, and all of those are centered right around the center of the day. In our current structure, students do have a home base period, but it could be anywhere from first to eighth period, depending on how that works. And even on the remote days, we're still asking those students to engage at, via Zoom during home base in most cases. And so we really are then talking about four hours of Zoom with five minute breaks built in, but no break more significant than five minutes in most cases for our middle school students. And also many of our teachers do teach straight through that, that time as well. And so this is, this is a, a, a goal we would very much like to accomplish. And this is an example that we spent some time looking at are there shorter term ways to do this? Is this something we could do more quickly? One suggestion was, could we do it on the, on the remote days only? So on the days that seventh grade students are at, attending off-site, attending via Zoom, could we just add a break for those students in their schedule? P pop a lunch in the middle and then keep them going. And the, the reality is that there are so many teachers that teach both seventh and eighth grade and, and supports that are assigned at multiple grade levels. You simply can't disrupt the seventh grade day off-site without disrupting equally the eighth grade day on the site. That's actually why we're doing map testing in the way we are at the middle schools. It's the same idea. And so then we said, well, okay, could we maybe shorten the passing periods by a minute and maybe add a few minutes in the middle of the day and on-site students could read and off-sites they would have a break. And, and at the end of the day, this is where we said we need, we need more voices in the room. There, aren't, there isn't a solution that we can see in the short term that gets to a meaningful break in the day for students and staff without, again, some anticipated disruption. And so before we go forward with that, we really want to, to, to ask the committee to work through this as well. And tying into that then, obviously, would be that desire for increased synchronous time in the middle school. I think we, we recognize that we are, that it, it is, you know, on average, about 15 minutes less per day per subject than, you know, synchronously. Now obviously there is asynchronous work being built in and, and teachers are doing a wonderful job of providing assignments and keeping students on track as, as best we are able. And yet again, I think we would all like to see that synchronous time increase. One possibility here could be exploring the addition of lunch to the on-site day and what that would look like. That was something we were very hesitant to explore in July and August when we hadn't lived through this. I think. There is, you know, I'm not going to say that there's going to be great rejoicing about bringing, talking about lunch, but I think that it's something now that we, we can visualize what this day looks like and we have some routines established. It's, it's a conversation that can come back around, but it's a conversation that, again, needs to work through a group of people who can really add all of the different perspectives of the middle school experience as we think through that. Within specialized programs, really our, our goal at this point is to work back to where we were prior to the break. You know, any, any of our students lose some of those routines over an extended break from school. Um, 
specialized programs has a significant advantage in that they have had a consistent model for the entire instructional year. And so that's really helped to refine and revise those procedures within those classrooms. And so we're really working to get back to all of the practices that minimized, if not eliminated in many cases, those close contact scenarios. So we're, we're excited to see that work come back together. Again, this will just be ongoing internal enhancement and revision with no major structural changes for our specialized programs. And similarly with our preschool, there was a lot of feedback that the timing that we've created really seems to hit the, a developmental sweet spot for students in terms of synchronous and, and the type of asynchronous work that's there. Um, we're looking at assessment in, in preschool right now and recognizing that so much of that assessment is not only one-on-one -on -one, but very hands-on and, and very, very close together. And so we're working through right now the, the ways to ensure that we are authentically assessing within the constraints that we have and also balancing the need for all of those assessments with the ongoing instruction and care for our students. So that's really where we're at with preschool. To talk a little bit more about the concept behind these instructional planning committees, we'd be looking at one to focus on middle school, one to focus on elementary school. While we have appreciated volunteers for all of our working groups going back to June, in this case, we certainly are hopeful for volunteers, but we also want to make sure that this, these committees are well represented. Sometimes in scenarios, we might have a handful of you know, six or seven fifth grade teachers, but no first or second grade teachers who happen to volunteer for one particular experience. So we want to structure this in a way that it represents buildings and grade levels well across the district. We'll be looking at meetings outside of the school day. We're hoping to accomplish four meetings over the course of the next six weeks or so. Um, invitations and interest forms will start going out tomorrow by buildings, so we're hoping to form the committee in the next week and then begin with those meetings. Obviously, the goals for the committee we've shared through previous slides, and our hope is then on February 22nd, which had been slated as the curriculum workshop, we would be able to return with the result of the committee conversations, so that, that across those four meetings. And the way we want to approach the committees is that their, their charge is really to determine are there solutions to these problems that are feasible and manageable, and also to have the conversation about kind of at what institutional cost can these solutions be achieved? Because there are solutions to virtually every one of the, of the challenges we put forth in these growth areas. The question at this point, looking at the timing of it all and recognizing, going back to that feedback we've gotten about the impact of change, we want to have the conversation with the committees, not only what can we do, but what will, what, will we, what will the impact be? What will, again, what will our institutional cost be as we go into considering changes? And that's the, the work we're looking to really process through and be able to bring back, hopefully on the, on the 22nd. We'll bring back a report on the 22nd. Our first implementation target is the trimester. It's a really nice, clean place if we're going to make a change, to make a change at the beginning of third trimester. However, this is, these are some big asks of the committee, and so we'll, our report on the 22nd will reflect where we are at in those conversations and what we feel we are able to, to present at that time. As we look at the recommitment process, one of the things we've shared many times is that we had asked families to make a commitment until we get to this point, and then there would be an opportunity for recommitment. So as we're not making a, a wholesale change to the structure, we're going to send an update out to families tomorrow midday that includes a summary of what we've shared tonight. And essentially what we're going to say is we're assuming you want to stay where you're at. If your family has elected fully remote at this point, we will assume that you want to stay there and vice versa in hybrid unless you let us know. And so we'll give families a week to inform by informing their building principal if they wish to make that change. And then we'll, again, we are now asking that the choice we make this week or the choice we remain in this week will be for the duration of the trimester. And I think knowing where we are and, and having been able to look that far ahead and having experienced this for a while, we're hopeful that that, that, that that commitment will be comfortable for families because one of the things we often hear is it's hard to commit unless we know what we're committing to. In this case, we're all very familiar with what we're committing to at this point. Once we get that final potential recommitment, then it's, we do need to take a look at, at class sizes and structures across the district. Um, because we really do have to take a look at what the result of some additional switches may have been or may have occurred. If we find ourselves in a situation with an on-site class of two or three students, we need to pause and consider whether that is truly best for those two or three students, whether that's the instructional model we would want or 
is a slightly larger class going to allow for more opportunities, more interactions, more peer modeling, more small group opportunities. Similarly, we have some remote sections at the middle school right now that are sitting in the low 30s. And if, if we were to get an influx of, of additional remote students, that number could potentially grow. And I think that's when we need to stop and say, okay, it's, it's possible to do this. Is it the best instructional model for our students versus the potential impact of changing that by potentially opening another section, which in the middle school typically has a pretty quick ripple effect on student schedules. So it, we, we, we'll go back to something in the first slide. We would like to avoid teacher and schedule changes for students at, at every possible turn here. But we do need to acknowledge that there are some potential places in very specific situations where we may need to look at it, not just for the sake of hitting some specific balance number, but really thinking about what is that educational experience for the students based on the size and structure of the classes. So again, just a brief look at where we're at. We are sharing that update tomorrow. Changes by the 19th. The Instructional Planning Committee begin January 25th. We've got that sort of first end of the month target for some of the shorter term enhancements that we're looking at. And then we'll be back on February 22nd to share the work of the committees looking toward the beginning of the trimester on March 8th. So just as we conclude, uh, some other health protocols, uh, we had talked about shortening the quarantine period. Again, I want to uh, reemphasize to the public, 14 days is a quarantine period. However, it can be shortened per the CDC if you meet uh, the requirements and only if you meet those requirements. When will this be put into place? When I wrote this presentation last week with Justin, on Friday we had put as soon as possible. After meeting with Jessica Stewart this morning, we can actually start that now. So people who are in quarantine do have the ability to shorten that. Uh, those regulations have been in place since December of 2020 and so that will take uh, effect immediately as we uh, begin to work with families who find themselves in that situation or staff members. Temperature checks. We had talked about eliminating uh, temperature checks, not the self-certification and not, you know, telling parents that they don't need to take their child's temperature. All sorts of, all that still has to take place at the home. In terms of standing there outside or in the doorway, which we know we're having significant issues with because of unreliability in terms of the temperatures, we would continue those throughout this week, but then eliminate them on the other side of Martin Luther King weekend and hopefully gain back some of that instructional time. We're just not seeing it as effective at um, stopping people with fevers um, and it really is, is an unreliable measurement. The research is pretty clear that it, it doesn't work and uh, so we're going to eliminate that piece of it, but obviously still continue with our rigorous self-certification and follow up with any families that are not uh, doing the rigorous self-certification process. So with that, uh, prior to getting to board questions, I want to hit on one thing that Justin had talked about. Um, you know, in addition to the administrators, I, I really want to thank two groups, um, our, our students and staff, uh, for all that they've gone through this year. Uh, and they've done just a tremendous job of being <laughs> flexible and uh, creative. And, and then, of course, the final group I think is our families and our parents out there. I'm a parent with, with seven kiddos going through this right now and um, it's a tough, tough journey that we're all on, uh, but I'm very proud of the work that we've been doing as a district. Everybody's pulling together and I believe that's why we're ahead of many other districts uh, because of the work that we're doing together and we want to continue to stay that way. So yes, it does take a lot of input, but all that input is worth it and uh, our team is committed to getting that input. So with that, uh, questions, uh, feedback, and input from the board are always welcome as well. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, fantastic presentation. I do want to thank you guys for continually trying to find ways to in improve on this year, which has not been ideal in, in many cases, while also really taking a look out for the impact that's going to have on, on students, and we really appreciate it. And so I'm going to put this up to questions, but I, I do just want to commend slide four, and we don't have to throw it up, but that's the list of all of the meetings that I had. And, and when I originally looked at this, I made the comment of, look how small the font had to be to get all that stuff on, onto one page. I think that just says a lot about um, the level of effort that not only the administrative team, but the teachers and everybody um, has 
has been involved with in making sure that we could continually try to find a way to improve this, um, to find ways to get more time with their students, and I, and I think that that uh, should be commended, so thank you. Um, but with that, then, I'll, let's open it up to questions yeah, or comments. My, my only comment is that I kind of want to echo what Darren says. I think, you know, if you kind of look at this, uh, you know, through a, a lens of being 2020 and with hindsight, I think it's, a, you know, realistic change management. It's, it's been very effective to kind of, you know, we're not just changing things for the sake of change. We're really being deliberate. And, and I think that kind of, this, this presentation is a, a good indicator of that. So, so I just want to commend the team on that. Thank you. Um, I, have, I have a comment and a question. Um, again, it was an exhaustive list of things the last two months or month and a half, and so I know teachers are very, very busy, and so the fact that there are volunteers to, for them to talk uh, and be part of the uh, conversation to, to make things better than they already are um, on top of their daily workload, that, that does it. it's not lost on me and probably not the rest of the board. So thank you to all the teachers that are helping with that. Um, as far as the health protocols, uh, my question is, because it's changing, um, this might seem really silly, but um, is all of this going to be uniformly um, acknowledged on both the websites with the nurses so that like a building secretary knows, like we, we might know from up here, but at the, at the building level where the point of contact with families are, everyone is well versed on all this so that they're not behind the curve? Yeah, that is certainly our intention, and, and Jessica and I have a follow-up meeting. One of the things I want to commend Jessica Stewart on is um, really working with our nurses to be that point of contact. Um, you know, when you have 13 schools, not every message will always get delivered consistently, and I think one of the things that we've really strived on is to continually meet with our nurses and, and, and with our office staff and so parents get the correct answer. Another tool that we have and we continue to fine-tune is on our district's website, our nursing team has developed a COVID-19 web page with, with a lot of resources on there. And so that is exactly our goal, is to make sure that we're giving people consistent answers, recognizing that we always have it throughout the course of the school year, and we want to continue to fine tune that and get better and better at that. Yeah, I just want to make sure that what we're talking about tonight gets translated onto the website. And I know the yes. nurses put together those packets for families when it does come up. So I want to make sure all of the paperwork and packets and information that that all gets updated as well for families. Yeah, and the other person that I want to mention in this too is Megan Hewitt and uh, everybody we've been meeting with telling you that this is the recommendation and so I know Jessica's already been having these conversations with our nursing staff and, and Megan will make sure that that gets out there in all the communications. But that is certainly something that we're going to hit in all of our communications and make sure everything's ready to go. Great, this is because I, I have kids in, I have one kid in one school, but there's lots of families that have multiple buildings. And so we wanna make sure that the message is consistent and the rules are the same for everywhere. Um, um, and maybe promoting it on the social media page too yeah. for the district to let people know that there has been a change. No, I appreciate you bringing that up because there's nothing worse, and I can say this having kids at multiple schools, than getting one answer at one school and then a different answer at another school or, or not knowing where to point people. Uh, so thank you for that reminder. And then with the one other question, and you don't have a magic eight ball or anything, but um, mm -hmm. would you say that um, the one slide about the uh, January 20th and the class sizes and such, are you seeing momentum of, of, of questions and, and people wanting to come back that might have been remote before? Are you anticipating um, I, a you change, know, or is that, is that just on there? I think what, what's, bet. well, I'll tell you what's not on there is at which date will we finish all those changes, and that's exactly because <laughs> we don't have a good way to predict exactly what it's going to look like. Is there a chance that some of the families who switched to fully remote for the weeks between Thanksgiving and, and winter break might make a change? It's possible, but, but it's hard to know without knowing the individual thought process for each family that, that, sure. that made those choices. A again, so we'll, that's why we, we knew we'd have this opportunity. We'll take a look and see how the, the numbers look at each individual building and then go from there. In some cases, it may be minimal to no change. In other cases, there we may have to look a little more closely. I, I think one of the, you know, the, the kind of piggyback off of Justin again nobody has a crystal ball that can predict and every time I do during this pandemic it, it usually turns out the opposite way and so I want to be careful here but I think because we've been in this model consistently I think a lot of people after Thanksgiving that said you know what I'm just not comfortable so I think a lot of this is already baked into the numbers that we have okay. 
Um, if anything, what, what I'm anticipating, again, full disclosure, could be wrong, now that our district has demonstrated that, um, you know, we put these protocols in place, again, not saying that there's ever a risk-free environment, but we're doing a pretty good job of this. And so we might see an uptick in, in kiddos who, uh, or families who want their kiddos on site, but again, I think the numbers will stay relatively close to where we're at right now. The, the trick is what Justin alluded to, is it's where those numbers change can make all the difference in the world for a certain school or a grade level, um, depending on, sometimes it just takes a few kids one way or the other that can really have a monumental change. Other, other places it won't impact it all that much. But if I were to guess, I think our numbers would stay relatively consistent <coughs> just based on the feedback that we're getting from families as they've been working with our principals over the last couple of months. I just wonder because we've already been in school for a week and a half that you might have been starting to get some emails. Yeah, so principals are, oh, principals are getting yeah. emails from families. I met with one principal in particular today and I asked him that question. I said, have you been getting contact? Did you have people who are remote who want to come back in or vice versa? Um, he shared that he hasn't been getting who's in person wanting to go remote, but he has had about four or five families contact him and say, you know, when we do make the switch, I'd like to come back on site. Super, thank you. I'll, uh, just a couple of comments. One, uh, echo the sentiment around this uh, transparency and the like lean towards consistency and the pace of change being something that we want to make sure that we bring everybody along to. It, it can't be overstated how long that, how far that goes in the community to give everybody a preview with the weeks to be able to anticipate uh, what's coming up next as much as possible in a time where that's very difficult to do. Uh, what's coming up next, I think as a district, I'm hearing just general sentiment around uh, that being appreciated. And then the second one, uh, there's a uh, potential growth area, number one. It's the one that I, I'm going to be looking at uh, especially uh, for in February when you make the presentation back to us is around the area around differentiation mm -hmm. and what that looks like in this strange classroom model, remote learning, asynchronous, all of the work that we're doing. Differentiation is an area where I, I think that if we can get that right, it'll be able to help us going into next fall and uh, next spring when we're starting to play much, a lot more catch up that we don't have to play as much catch up and so um, I'm going to be particularly inter interested in that in the work that's happening through the committees with differentiation. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have one member who's uh, dialed in today so I, I want to make sure that we don't kind of uh, uh, skip past Emily. I don't know if you have any comments or, or questions tonight. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Okay, I just have one comment that I wanted to make um, in reference to uh, temporary um, remote learning, which is the reason I am not able to be there tonight. I have quarantining family members here at home, and I just wanted to say that we have had nothing but a great experience so far. I have three different kids in three different buildings, and the staff in each of those buildings has gone way above and beyond to make sure that my kids have been able to stay connected to their classes and um, get as much of an authentic experience as possible while they are learning at home. So I just wanted to say thank you for that and that um, the work that's already needed, done, I know that, that that situation can always be improved upon, but um, my experience that I'm having personally right now has been really great given the challenges that are obviously present no matter what we do. So I just wanted to say that um, I think that there's already a lot of good work going on there so we can continue that. Emily, thank you for sharing that. That was uh, actually a really good perspective that I don't, that none of us on the board have had. So I, I, I appreciate that. Um, just one last comment I think I'd want to make and that, uh, that, that ties to that March 8th date, which is the beginning of, of trimester three. And it, as we sort of lead into that, um, I think it's really important that we're looking at what all of our possible points are that we could reach before the end of the year. Because I think that's a great opportunity. If, if any tweaks or, or shifts have to be made, um, that is obviously the ideal time. We learned ha after having that, what was it, six weeks at the beginning of the year, or eight weeks, whatever it was, and then we made that shift. We did that early ending of the, the trimester because it was a nice opportunity for us to have a clean break. And you, you talked a little bit about expanding the days in the middle school. Um, 
is there any possibility that we think we would be getting to a point where we would combine the AM and PM in the grade schools? And if we do, you know, would that, even if we couldn't do that in March, at the beginning of March, I think that's something that we have to have in our mindset, if that's a possibility, making sure that we sort of have something aligned there to work. Or if it's not a possibility, then have that, that discussion as well. But um, I know that was something we had talked about early on. And even if we can't do that on March 8th, which I don't think any of us are anticipating, I just I don't want to see a major disruption come towards the end of April or, or, or something along those lines. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that. That's exactly the way we want to structure these committee conversations. Because like we said, there are, there are many things we can do. The question is what happens once we do that? Once we make that one change, what happens next? And, and, and when and if that disruption would be appropriate and, and like I said earlier, worth it for the time we have left and, and what we're trying to accomplish for our students. So absolutely, that's I appreciate that. Yeah, and that, you know, that's the time that that's how you're going to align the next block of commitments, right, is, is for that March 8th time frame. So what we can, the image that we can paint and, and sort of describe what the remainder of the year is going to look like um, and what our, what our arching goals are, I think, is, is going to be really important. So I'm looking forward to seeing, I'm, I'm assuming we'll get a little bit more detail around that on the, the 22nd of February. Yeah, exactly, because that's when the committee will have had hours and hours worth of conversation around those types of things, and that yeah. it's, it's that work that we hope to use to answer the questions you're posing right now, is what do we believe the rest of the year can and should look like? Well, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you uh, so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and that leads us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to a future agenda or addressed by the administrative staff as appropriate. Uh, just a reminder that criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allocated 30 minutes um, All right, for public comment at this time. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any comments tonight. All right. All right, so we're going to go ahead and, and skip over recess and go on to the approval of minutes. Uh, are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from December 7th, 2020 special meeting and financial workshop as presented? Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Uh, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the December 7th, 2020 special meeting and financial workshop as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the December 14th, 2020 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Thank you. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. And Member Hughes. Uh, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the December 14th, 2020 regular meeting as presented. We Next up is our a consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? Second. All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Olchek. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We have some recommendations for actions tonight. We uh, do not have a, uh, a recommendation for board action on the return to learn plan. So that brings us to a resolution declaring intent to issue working cash fund bonds. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution declaring the intention to issue $3,335,000 in working cash fund bonds of the, of the district for the purpose of increasing the working cash fund of the district and directing that notice of such intent being be published in a manner provided by law? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. 
Member Hughes. Aye. Uh, the motion carried to adopt the resolution declaring the intention to issue $3,335,000 working cash fund bonds of the district for the purpose of increasing the working cash fund of the district and directing that notice of such intention to be published in the manner provided by law. Next up is a resolution calling a public hearing. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution calling a public hearing concerning the intent of the Board of Education of the District to sell $3,335,000 in working cash fund bonds for the purpose of increasing the working cash fund bond of the district? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? I think just, just, just a uh, point to make around, uh, this is really a mandate for us in our ability to stay not as far behind in our facility needs and updates that are that are well overdue uh, a rooftop unit that is being used 32 years when it's supposed to be for 15. Um, i mean we're in a position where uh, this is at best a band-aid and so these are these are obviously circumstances under which nobody predicted that we would we would be in, in during a pandemic but um, i just appreciate uh, todd and kevin and the entire team for finding ways to make things work in a time where it's really tough to make things work. I just hope the community recognizes how much work is going into trying to put band-aids over things that, that need to be addressed facilities was. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution calling a public hearing concerning the intent of the Board of Education of the District to sell $3,335,000 in working cash fund bonds for the purpose of increasing the working cash fund of the district. We have a bid for a floor tile abatement for Henry Puffer basement and two in uh, at O'Neill and two O'Neill classrooms. Is there a motion to award the bid for asbestos abatement to the Henry Puffer basement and two O'Neill classrooms to EHC for a total of $63,250. So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Uh, the motion carried to award the bid for asbestos abatement in the Henry Puffer basement and two O'Neill classrooms to EHC for a total of $63,250. Next up is a bid for new flooring for Henry Puffer basement and three O'Neill classrooms. Is there a motion to award the bid for flooring installation in the Henry Puffer basement and three O'Neill classrooms to Mazzarini Inc. for a total of $77,130.99? Is there any discussion? I do just want to note that there is one more classroom in here compared to the abatement. That's because one of them doesn't have asbestos tile in them. And if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the money for these projects is being funded by that grant that we had applied for that, some time ago. Yes, that's correct. So this is the $50,000 match grant. So the, the grant doesn't take care of all of that, but we do have 50000 being put up by the grant, the remaining portion uh, being paid for by the district. So this is a great opportunity. This was scheduled work and in. So grant pays for 50000 The district covers the balance of it. Uh, and, and thank you guys for continuing to find ways to help uh, fund these important projects. Uh, any other discussion or questions? No. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the bid for flooring installation in the Henry Puffer basement and three on oak classrooms over to uh, Mazzarini Inc. for a total of $77,130.99. Uh, next up is a white engineering proposal for Fairmount mechanical equipment improvements. Is there a motion to approve the white engineering proposal for fair, uh, Fairmount mechanical equipment improvements as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion here? Uh, Todd, I'm sorry I didn't ask this question earlier today when we were speaking, um, but it just occurred to me now. I just, it's, a, it's a quick question. Um, this was not, um, it didn't go to bid, did it? No, this is, this is uh, white doing the engineering work. Um, and is there in prep, is there architect of record it. right there are professional record. services right okay. mm -hmm. and because it, it we foresee that because of the amount there are certain pieces like the rooftop unit at 
Pierce Downer that we replaced with the roofer, with the roofing. We took, that would have normally, if that was all we were doing, we would have just put that in with the roofing contract and been done with it. Mm -hmm. We did, you know, because we've got all these, you know, a few other pieces and that and some others, what we did was take that, put that aside and work with, and then put it under white to do this piece. And because all of a sudden we're at a point where we're at the 25 threshold, uh, that's what we're bringing it back to, you know, bringing it to the board for approval so that, you know, you have that. Uh, Todd, while you're up here, a question. This is a relatively large dollar amount up upcoming. Obviously, this is the engineering work, but we expect that the work will be uh, north of $300,000. Um, do we anticipate that coming out of bond proceeds? The bonds proceeds? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Samasi. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the white engineering proposal for Fairmount mechanical equipment improvements as presented. Next up is the 2021 through 2022 preschool fees. Is there a motion to set the 2021 through 2022 Grove Children's Preschool non-refundable registration fee at $50 and annual tuition at $3,790? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to set the 2021 through 2022 Grove Children's Preschool non-refundable registration fee at $50 and annual tuition at $3,790. All right. Next up is the authority to execute future fixed electrical rate agreement. Is there a motion to give the assistant superintendent for business the authority to execute a future fixed electrical agreement for up to 36 months starting June of 2021 at a rate not to exceed um, two cents and point zero two eight one five uh, dollars kilowatts per, you know, let me reword that, not to exceed <laughs> point zero two eight one five dollars per kilowatt hour. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right. Perfect. Um, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to give the assistant superintendent for business the authority to execute a future fixed electrical agreement for up to 36 months starting June 2021 at a rate not to exceed point zero two eight one five dollars per kilowatt hour all right we have some policies up for second reading and approval is there a motion to adopt revisions to policies three colon one three colon forty four eighty four ninety five two seventy six twenty six three forty seven one hundred seven one forty and seven three hundred so moved second is there any discussion all right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adapt the revisions to policies 340, 480, 490, 5270, 620, 6340, 7100, 7140, and 7300. All right, we have policy 7190 student behavior. Is there a motion to adopt revisions to the policy 7190 student behavior as presented? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? I just want to note that this is the one that we did not do for a first reading and was presented to us in the uh, early report. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Samantha. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchin. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt revisions to policy 7190 student behavior as presented. A couple of announcements. We have some uh, dates to note. Uh, Tuesday, January 19th at 7 a.m. will be the poli policy committee. They are meeting over Zoom. 
Wednesday, January 27th at 3.45 p.m. The Legislative Committee is meeting over Zoom. And Wednesday, February 3rd at 3.45 p.m. The Legislative Committee is meeting again on Zoom. So you're meeting two weeks in a row? Hey, we got the Super Bowl coming up. All right. <laughs> Just making sure. All right. And then uh, Monday, February 8th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular uh, board meeting right here at Village Hall. And we'll also be live streaming that. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to, to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, 5 ILCS 122 C1, collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives, or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, 5 ILCS 122 C2, Litigation, when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis of the finding shall be recorded and entered in the minutes of the closed meeting, 5 ILCS 122 C11. And discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval of the body of the minutes or semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 2.06, 5 ILCS 122 C21. Is there a motion? No motion. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet at 9.05 p.m. All right, the board has returned to open session here at 9.34 p.m. Uh, we, we have some actions as a result of closed session. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the December 7th, 2020 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the contents? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? I said All right, Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. See, can I yeah, it's not, not yet. Oh. Okay, Member okay. uh, Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I forgot you were physically moving that phone. They take a little while to boot up. <laughs> takes a little while for this phone to boot up so we're looking for uh, we're taking roll right now on uh, the meeting minutes approving the meeting minutes from December 7th 2020 so we're just looking for your yay or nay yay okay. all right thank you motion carried is there a motion to approve the minutes from the December 14th 2020 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the contents so moved second all right Melissa we please go roll Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. All right. That wraps up the night. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 9.37 p.m.